please welcome Burnsville Mayor and past president of the United States Conference of Mayors, Elizabeth Kautz. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying a wonderful lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Catherine Luger, President and CEO of the American Beverage Association and Chair of the American Beverage Foundation for a Healthy America, who will announce the winners of the 2023 Childhood Obesity Prevention, Environmental Health and Sustainability Awards. 2023 marks the beginning of the second decade of this amazing partnership. As of this year, we've awarded nearly $6 million to dozens of cities across the country. Over the astonishing life of this program, that $6 million in cash funding paid directly to cities because we mayors understand, and the American Beverage Association understands, that the best public-private partnership deliver critical resources direct to where they're needed, and that the best solution gets incubated at the local level. With not only mayors, but residents and small business and institutions and other community stakeholders. Today, another nine cities will share three quarters of a million dollars in grant awards to support existing and new programs that address child, family, community, and environmental health and wellness in America's cities. Catherine's a longtime friend of the of the conference because of who doesn't love a friend who supports you when and where and how you need it. It is the way that this program has supported our cities. Catherine, thank you for your leadership, for continuing your family's great legacy of service and for this great partnership with America's cities. Catherine, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mayor Kautz, for such a lovely and gracious introduction. I want to take a moment and also thank U.S. Conference of Mayors President Mayor Francis Suarez and of course the infamous Tom Cochran uh, for their leadership. Let's give them a round of applause. And to, to all of the mayors in the room, it really is an honor to once again be here with you today. I, I so look forward to this meeting every year. It is a great way to kick off January of each year because when I show up, your energy, your collegiality, your drive, it is all so invigorating. That's because as mayors, you all, and I'm gonna use a nice word, you all get stuff done. You solve problems because you're on the front line. They're at your doorstep. They affect your neighbors, they affect your friends, they affect your family. You find common ground because you know that it takes all of us together to bring about meaningful and long-lasting change. It's refreshing. Honestly, it is downright energizing, especially in a town where, sadly, we see too much gridlock and dysfunction. Each of you helps to foster a strong sense of community day in and day out. You help to make your communities healthier, cleaner, more sustainable, and more economically strong. And you do these things, of course, as mayors, but you do them 
as members of your communities, as neighbors to those you serve. All right, so what you may not think about is that for America's beverage companies, being there for our neighbors is a part of our DNA. That's because while we are proud to represent some of the most iconic global brands, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Keurig Dr. Pepper, and others, we're actually made up of local businesses, often multi-generational family-owned bottlers with roots that run deep in towns like yours. Our companies and their employees pride themselves on contributing to the communities where they too live, work, and operate. From the Pacific Northwest to the Deep South, from the Great Plains to New England, there is no part of our great country that we do not call home. And that's why we care so deeply about working with mayors of our hometowns and cities, because we want to support you in your efforts to make them the best they can be. So a couple of anecdotes, and I'll just mention these quickly because I think it's important to underscore how much this partnership matters. When our neighbors need clean drinking water, we step up. In Baltimore, the local bottler, Coca-Cola Consolidated, delivered more than 300 cases of cleaned bottled water to make sure that impacted residents uh, who were facing contamination had clean, safe water. The same thing in Jackson, Mississippi, when the flooded Pearl River last year exacerbated ongoing water quality issues, our local Pepsi bottler, Brown Bottling Group, made sure that residents there had clean water. But we also step up, and this is really important to hear, we step up in ways that have lasting impact on broader problems for our neighbors and for their families. A couple of quick examples, in Baton Rouge, Coke United, their employees worked alongside construction professionals to help build homes for Habitat for Humanity as a part of Women Build, or in Philadelphia, where a local Pepsi bottler, National Brand Beverages, they have a long-standing relationship and history of working on homelessness and with the Covenant House to support youth experiencing homelessness and to help them be empowered as they get a fresh start in life. Across the country, Keurig Dr. Pepper, they work with their partner, Kaboom, to provide play spaces for more than 13 and a half million children and their families in underserved neighborhoods. But we also know that having a strong economy and a strong job opportunities are fundamentally key to building strong communities. After all, and I referenced this earlier, our products are made and brought to life, brought to market through our local bottlers with local jobs, providing more than 265,000 good paying, family supporting jobs in communities all across the country. Many of those jobs don't require a college education, but you can support a family on them. We're working a partnership with you to support your efforts and mayor's efforts to make your communities healthier, more sustainable, and with practical and effective solutions. Solutions that support families who are looking to find balance in their diet by reducing the sugar they get from beverages. And I hope you all hear me really quickly on this. Our companies, America's beverage companies, are working with great intentionality to provide Americans everywhere with more choices, with less sugar than ever before, and in smaller packaging sizes. In fact, nearly 60% of beverages sold today have zero sugar. And I want you to hear me on that. 60% of beverages sold today have zero sugar. That was intentional. When we first partnered with the US Conference of Mayors more than a decade ago, many of those beverage options didn't exist. Think about the sparkling and flavored waters like AHA from the Coca-Cola company, Core from Keurig Dr. Pepper, or Bubbly from PepsiCo. Innovating new zero and low sugar products, providing clear calorie information on every bottle, can, and pack voluntarily. All of these play a role in driving sugar reduction and making our communities healthier for the long term. We're intentional in our actions to deliver more choices with less sugar, but I also want to be clear, we're proud of our strong progress and we know there is more to do. We are steadfast in our commitment. All right, we are also committed to making our communities more environmentally sustainable. 
In fact, we're making 100% recyclable containers for all of our beverage products. That includes our plastic bottles. I'll, I'll show you this one. Uh, in our communities across the nation, we're also working really hard to get those bottles back. Our plastic bottles are not single use. They are very intentionally made to be remade. And in fact, and I hope you all hear me on this, today, Coke, Pepsi, uh, Dr. Pepper, they all have bottled water brands that are packaged in 100% recycled, not recyclable. They are packaged in 100% recycled PET plastic bottles. Take a look. Take a look on yourselves for those. Bottles that have truly been remade into new ones. But that's not all we're doing. We know that recycling is not working as well as it can, and it must, to keep our packaging out of nature and out of landfills. And so through our Every Bottle Back initiative, we're investing $100 million to leverage and create a fund of half a billion dollars to improve and modernize recycling infrastructure in your communities. Today, we've invested in 27 communities from Iowa's Scott County to Michigan's Bay City to Nashville, Tennessee, and beyond. Together, and again, we're just starting, but together, these first investments will recycle a projected 720 million pounds of PET plastic and nearly 56 million pounds of aluminum, more, that's incremental growth, over the next 10 years. That means more sustainable communities, less waste, and more jobs. Our commitment to working in partnership with you to strengthening communities across our country, it remains a strong focus for our industry. And so I hope that before you leave this week, you connect with an American Beverage team member at our booth to learn more. All right, so let's get to the action. You all are here, uh, I think, partially to hear about our grant recipients. I am really proud to be here, not only in my role as President and CEO of the American Beverage Association, but to also share our industry's strong support of mayoral programs through the American Beverage Foundation for a Healthy America and our work with the U.S. Conference of Mayors on a long-standing partnership that's been making a real difference for so many of you. Like America's beverage companies, we know you too are taking bold steps to improve both the physical and the environmental health of your communities. We are so proud to recognize just some of those efforts as we announce the recipients of the 2023 Childhood Obesity Prevention and Environmental Health and Sustainability Awards. All right, so without further ado, let's announce the winners. Third place winners in each category will take home $15,000 grant for their program. Second place winners will take home $50,000. And so we'll start with the small city category winners. For small city, third place goes to Mayor Sean Patterson Howard of Mount Vernon, New York. For the Healthy Living Cafe, which will offer both young people and seniors a hands-on experience about grocery shopping, cooking, and nutritional well-being. In second place, recognition goes to Mayor Julio Roldan Concepcion of Aguadillo, Puerto Rico. For the recycling, <laughs> for the recycling interactive walking trail project. This new project will promote recycling along the trails of the Sandy Shats Urban Forest while helping families be outdoors and active. And now, the small city first place winner goes to Vicki Skamen of Oak Park, Illinois for the Cross Community Climate Collaborative, also known as C4. Mayor Skamen will be receiving $125,000 for her program. Let's take a moment to learn more about it. Our project is called C4, Cross Community Climate Collaborative. The concept was birthed out of a relationship that I have with our village president in River Forest, Kathy Aducey 
and Mayor Katrina Thompson of Broadview. And the hope was if we as mayors take a leadership role in bringing other mayors together to address climate change, then I think we can actually find solutions, not only individually, but collectively here in our own region. Having sector meetings. We meet as executive team every month with the partners that we have on our leadership board. And we are planning and strategically working with the other municipalities to keep them on task so that we meet all of our benchmarks, all of our goals and objectives, whether it's renewable energy, whether it's healthy homes to protect children with asthma or EV charging stations. Necessarily engaged. C4 has tapped into Darnell Johnson and Gary Cunin. They are expert advisors on what direction we need to take for C4. There really is a sense of urgency with this issue of climate and also a huge uh, issue around equity. These communities that we're focusing on, they create a very uh, diverse picture. We're looking at black, brown, and white communities that have traditionally done things in silos, right? Not my problem, not my priority. Now we're at a place where they're understanding, no, it is our problem and it should be our priority. Many of these communities have fewer resources. They don't have the staffing capacity to hire a sustainability coordinator or somebody to go after grants. So C4 is really intending to help support these communities at major projects. Looks like so they want to do a... It's going to take time, but we have to be intentional with the messaging and how we educate so people know how important it is. But listen, I'm talking about it every single day. <laughs> I'm very excited and grateful to be receiving this award from the American Beverage Foundation for a Healthy America and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. This grant is going to allow us to engage more communities in working together to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Otherwise, really great meeting, everybody. Send out the invitation. We believe that this is a great, great start to hopefully what will be a very large impact to our communities. Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Skamen is here with us today to accept the award, so please join me in welcoming not just Mayor Skamen, but also her C4 partners, River Forest Village President Kathy Adushi and Broadview Mayor Katrina Thompson. I have to say I met with them prior to this. These are ladies who get stuff done, so come on out. Thank you. On behalf of the C4 leadership team, River Forest Mayor Kathy Adusi, and Village of Broadview Mayor Katrina Thompson, and myself, thank you for this recognition and support from the American Beverage Association and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. This award will aid C4 in supporting 15 communities in our region of Illinois to address climate change collaboratively. C4, Cross Community Climate Collaborative, is all about working across our municipal borders to promote environmental justice and reduce greenhouse gas emissions for all of our communities. We are placing a priority on equity-centered sustainability projects in solidarity, bringing black, brown, and white communities together, sharing resources, information, and growing our efforts for greater impact aided by the expertise of Executive Director Gary Cunin of Seven Generations Ahead and Darnell Johnson, Urban Efficiency is a group CEO and founder. My gratitude for these beautiful ladies and Darnell and Gary is endless. I welcome you to reach out to learn more about C4 and how we can help you in your community. Thank you again to the American Beverage Association and U.S. Conference of Mayors.
All right, now let's go to the Medium City Award winners. For third place, the award goes to Mayor Walker Reed of Gastonia, North Carolina, for his litter-free walkways, which will help address litter prediction, prevention and reduction in Gastonia stream, benefiting both the residents and the river basin. Second place goes to Mayor Matthew Turk of Allentown, Pennsylvania to expand the Marathon Mayor Program and encourage the, the use of the 14-mile Jordan Creek Greenway Trail and other parks in Allentown. They're installing infrastructure to make them more functional, to expand existing physical activity programs, and engage children and families. All right, so now let's get to our Medium City first place winner. The award this year goes to Lansing, Michigan Mayor Andy Shore for the Grow Lansing program. Let's learn more. Lansing is a wonderful city. We are the capital city of the state of Michigan, about 115,000 people here in our city. When you're in an urban community, when you're in a city, all too often, you don't know where the food comes from. You just go to the local grocery store and there it is. You all have seeds in front of you? Yeah. Yeah, you're all checking them out? What do you guys have here? I got uh, onions. Onions, do you like onions? Yeah. Yeah. The Grow Lansing Mini Grant Program is a true partnership between the city of Lansing and the Garden Project. The goal is to really um, teach students and teach families in the city to grow their own local healthy food in a sustainable way. I'll eat all of it. I'll eat the squash, I'll eat the, the broccoli, I'll eat the... When people talk about sustainability, they want to be able to have the option to, to grow their own food. We are the kind of the urban hub for the region, but still having an urban agriculture uh, and a community garden where you can grow your own food, you can eat it, you can share it, you can um, sell it. It's, it's a really important piece of, of uh, what the communities are now. It's fascinating how many gardens we have. We, we don't think that we have them, and then we turn a corner and we see them. We'll be working with residents. The city puts a high value on neighborhood engagement. We're really working with them to make sure that neighborhoods are directing this process and deeply involved. If it is the neighborhood's idea, if it's the community's idea, then, it, then they definitely have the neighborhood and community buy-in. And at some point, you won't need the government's assistance in it because you've got all hands on deck for it. We could do so much with these funds, make those gardens more productive and create new gardens where there's a need. We tremendously appreciate the grant from the American Beverage Foundation for Healthy America. Uh, we appreciate the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, when they offer these grants, it's an avenue for us as cities to go in and grab some dollars to utilize for really good things for our community, to help out our kids. Uh, it is tremendously appreciated. I'll eat some more squash. And some more squash. And some more squash. And some more squash. And some more squash. These programs are all so inspirational. So Mayor Shore, Here's the exciting part. Mayor Shore will receive $175,000 to support Grow Lansing. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Shore. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always weird to see yourself in that video. Um, we're greatly appreciative uh, for the Conference of Mayors, the American Beverage Association. These dollars are going to be used for our Grow Lansing program, which you just saw, uh, and help our school and community gardens in our city. Um, it's going to improve nutrition, perishable foods for our kindergarten through eighth grade students with a focus on resource-challenged areas in our city. 
Um, we know that, that we had once thriving uh, gardens outside of our schools, but a lot of them wilted and died due to the pandemic. So now we're going to be able to re-engage. We're going to be able to show the urban students in our city exactly where food comes from and how you grow it. So again, thank you so much to the American Beverage Association, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, on behalf of the citizens of Lansing, our students, and, and everyone to show them how to grow food in our city. Thank you. All right, and we are now ready to move on to our final category, the awards for large city. The third place award for large city goes to Louisville, Kentucky, and Mayor Craig Greenberg to expand the Louisville is Engaging Children Outdoors, or Louisville Echo Program. They are staffing and outfitting the first outdoor learning center in West Louisville. Please join me in giving him a round of applause. Second place goes to Mayor Jim Ross of Arlington, Texas, for the Healthy Connections, a Healthy Arlington Initiative, which aims to uh, the further walkability within the city by designing 10-minute safe walks that get to healthy food sources, recreational, and educational locations. And finally, our first place award for large city goes to Charlotte, North Carolina, and Mayor Vi Alexander Lyles for the Deputy Diversion Program. Let's take a moment and learn a little more. Charlotte is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. Our community has been doing recycling for many, many years. But right now, we need to think a lot bigger than just recycling, and that's where the circular economy comes into play. Finding another home for material versus the landfill is where we want to strive to be. We are looking to be the first to be able to say that we have created a zero waste or circular economy. What are we going to do about that, guys? We can't put these in landfills forever. Doing something, trying every innovation, trying every opportunity of where we can make a difference, we should grab it and hold on to it. And if it's effective, make sure that it's something that everyone can be a part of. The Innovation Barn is a hub for the circular economy. And so we bring individuals, companies, the city, and nonprofits together to really advance those goals. How many of you help your parents recycle at home? The Deputy Diversion Program is an education program. We want to divert from the landfill. Plastic bottles. And we're going to have you come up here, and we're going to see if you can get, take the right items and put them in the recycling bin. We want to arm people that you are a deputy of this program, meaning you are now empowered with this education to go and tell your neighbors, tell your school, tell your parents on how to properly divert from the landfill. What are the specific items that they can curbside recycle here in our community? We would love for everything to be 100% recyclable or repurposed. We have to start somewhere. So if we can actually get these habits ingrained in our youth, it should continue. Can I put this in the recycling? No. no. When you can have a young person learn something and take it home and begin to say, well, why can't we do this? Why can't we recycle this mom? We We're building a generation through this program of influencers. And they're going to grow up, and they're going to do a better job than we have. They're also going to learn all about closed-loop systems like aquaponics. So we're really looking forward to getting into the nitty-gritty of how we really move the needle on the circular economy. As mayor of Charlotte, and on behalf of our 900,000 residents, I want to thank the American Beverage Foundation for a Healthy America for this award and recognition. I want to thank the U.S. Conference of Mayors for the work that they're doing to ensure that we're going to build a better world for the next generation. We are, we are so proud to announce Mayor Lyles will receive a $250,000 grant for her program. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Lyles. Wow, 
Wow, this is pretty amazing. $250,000 to invest in making our city a better place to live. I want to thank again the United Conference of Mayors, the American Beverage Association, and the American Beverage Foundation. I want you to know that's important about this generous award that they've made for us. Through the Deputy Diversion Program, middle school youth throughout Charlotte will participate in a three-hour Saturday morning program to learn how to recycle and reduce food waste, teaching them the importance of maintaining and supporting our environment. I want you to know that these kids are going to be the ones that carry us forward. And what they're doing today will pay back so much more in the future. But I also want to thank our team in Charlotte. I want Victoria Johnson, who's not here today, and Envision Charlotte, who you saw Amy on the video, to know how much we appreciate what they're doing. Because no one does anything by themselves, but together we can do so much more. Thank you very much. All right, aren't these programs inspirational? I hope you're all thinking about how to apply for them. All right, so to all of today's winners, I wanna thank you. Thank you for what you do to advance such innovative programs, and congratulations on your recognition today. We really do look forward to hearing more about how these grants help your communities back at home. Now, I just made a plug for this, but for those of you who have not yet submitted grant applications, I really do hope and encourage you to submit an application for the 24 grant cycle. Uh, we are excited and delighted to support your programs that make a difference on environmental and physical health. All right, in closing, I want to reiterate, and I'm sure that's the best words you've heard, in closing, I want to reiterate that really on behalf of the beverage industry, we are so grateful for your service. We are grateful for the important work that you're doing, for the problems you are solving. As you go back home, please know that America's beverage industry, your local bottlers, our companies, we are all committed to working with you to make sure that your communities are healthier, stronger, and more economically sustainable. So please, thank you for your leadership and for all that you do. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And let's again give a big hand for all the mayors who won today. And I'm going to echo uh, Catherine's um, plea to all of the mayors and encourage all of you to apply for this grant in the fall. I applied. And let me tell you, it was wonderful. We were a recipient, and it really helped launch our Grow Burnsville initiative. So we'll announce the 2024 application launch at the upcoming annual meeting in Columbus. So stay tuned. Our next speaker is Amelia Dunlap, Vice President of Marketing with Nationwide Retirement Solutions. Nationwide is a platinum partner of the Conference of Mayors. Their focus is on being the best in helping our city workers prepare for and live in retirement through relevant solutions like our deferred compensation plan and post-employment health plans and deliver better retirement outcomes. Nationwide administer the retirement savings need of employees in cities like Chicago, <coughs> Phoenix, Denver, Des Moines, Huntington, West Virginia, and over 4,000 other cities, towns, and villages. <coughs> Nationwide is the number one provider of retirement plans in the government market with a long-standing and strong commitment to public sector employees. We're excited to partner with the largest and most innovative company in the industry as they bring new solutions to our employees preparing for and living in retirement. Based in Columbus, Ohio, we are also excited 
to be in their backyard for our summer 2023 annual meeting and experience the partnership, people, and commitment to their community firsthand. Mayors, please join me in welcoming Amelia. Thank you, Mayor Kautz, and thank you so much for having me here today. I just had an opportunity to talk with Tom Cochran backstage, and he was so nice to me considering that I'm a Buckeye and he's a Bulldog, and we're still a little, a little spiteful about that one. But we're happy to be here, and as um, we just mentioned, really excited to um, be partnering with the Conference of Mayors. It's Nationwide Retirement Solutions. We pride ourselves in, in working with the conference to really help the employees in your cities prepare for and live in retirement. And we know retirement is one of those goals that affects all of us very differently, um, but we really are hyper-focused, obsessed even, with how we can provide better retirement outcomes for all of the participants in our plans. And we do that through a number of ways, whether it's our award-winning digital tools or the people that we have that meet with the participants in our plans that provide education and advice and guidance. You know, one of the areas I wanted to just speak briefly about today is our focus over the past um, couple of years on the not only in preparing for, but living in retirement side of that equation. And we've seen that over the past number of years as a retirement industry, we have brought the message to market where we have said, save, 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 save some more. And then people get to the point of retirement and want to know what to do. And so we have made a significant investment in really trying to build that retirement confidence through solutions that can provide guaranteed income for life during the post-retirement um, period. And so one of the things we're really excited about is knowing that this meets the needs of so many of the employees uh, that we all are here to represent. And we recently did a study where we were uh, looking at retirement confidence across um, all kinds of different workers, public and private sector. And what we're seeing is that confidence in retirement income is waning. It's worse amongst women. About 62% of women uh, felt that they were less confident in their expectations and ability to retire than even just last year. And that's um, also accompanied by men who are about at 47%. So lots to say there about the needs that we have across our participant base. So we are very excited that this spring we're going to be bringing some solutions to market. One of them is called Income America 5 for Life, and it is going to be added. So for any of you that are clients of ours, it's going to be added to our investment lineup, and it provides guaranteed income for life starting at that point of retirement at 5%. And so one of the benefits of being an insurance company as well is that we can guarantee that income for life. It functions very much like a retail annuity, however, provides a lot of portability and control amongst the participants. So we're excited to be bringing these types of innovative solutions. And as you heard earlier, we are incredibly excited to have you all in our hometown um, here this summer. It is quite literally out of my window that I see every day where you will all be for our conference in June. And so in partnership with the city and Mayor Ginther's office, Nationwide is really excited to show you what's so great about Columbus. You saw a, a highlight reel this morning, and, and we are looking forward to really hosting and, and showing you the best that we have to offer. Um, I'll close by saying thank you. So many of you in here are clients of ours. Um, as you heard earlier, we represent about 4,000 cities, um, and we administer the deferred comp plans um, for the employees, ranging from cities with one participant all the way up to some of the largest cities that, that you heard referenced earlier. And for those of you who aren't clients of ours, we would love to speak with you and tell you about how we're doing more to help drive the right participant outcomes to help the employees in your cities prepare for and live in retirement. Thanks again for having me today. Boston Mayor Michelle Wu is a daughter of immigrants, yes. A Boston Public Schools mom and a public transit commuter. She took office in November 2021, the first woman and 
first person of color elected as mayor of Boston, championing a vision for her city as a green and growing city for all. Mayor Wu is working in partnership across every level of government with businesses and in her community to make Boston a leading city where families thrive. Today, Mayor Wu will be discussing what it means to be a city whose approach to growth and governance is centered on the people and possibilities. Please join me in welcoming Mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. Good afternoon. Um, I am so, so humbled and excited to be here with you all. Um, as you can tell, this is my first U.S. Conference of Mayors event, just a year into the office. And so I want to thank Tom and the entire team and everyone who's been involved in putting this together. Um, and thank you to you all. I uh, want to tell you a little bit about an issue that we've been working on in Boston and where we see some signs of hope and possibility. Um, I want to tell you, put out a personal ask for, for some advice as well. Uh, but first, I want to tell you what the speech is not about. I know the title is Embracing uh, the Possibility. I'm not here to talk about our new beautiful memorial that I know everyone has had some opinions on. Everyone's an art critic these days. But we love, <laughs> we love it in Boston. And it's been such a symbol of the chance for community to really hook arms, link arms, and uh, stand together in the fight for racial justice that continues to this day. So we're very proud of the embrace and all that has gone into that. So my personal ask, um, I'm a year and two months in now, and next Thursday is my very first State of the City address. I am terrified, and please come up to me afterwards and share your, your best ideas of how to do this. How do you possibly tell the story of all the experiences that you've had in a year? The potholes, the fires, the late night events, the early morning ride-alongs. How do you possibly thank properly an entire city workforce that has put so much on the line through a pandemic? How do you avoid having words and gestures turned into a meme on social media afterwards? Um, lots of things that I want to learn from you all. We are, after all, operating in a larger moment at the local level all across the country of being in a nation divided right now. And that plays out in all different ways and how, as a society, we're trying to figure out how to connect, how to build community. Um, what is the truth? How do we cut through the noise to get to that? And whether and why to bother with, with this thing we have called democracy. Mayors have always been at the front lines of that messy, beauty, beautiful conflict of democracy, and never more, never, ever, more, now more than ever, we are truly at the front lines of all the many ways in which the pand pandemic continues to impact our residents. In Boston, there is no clearer embodiment of decades of social structures being dismantled, the need for federal or state resources that have taken some time getting here, the pressures of the housing market, the trauma that has gone untreated in communities, no greater embodiment of that than an area of our city known as Mass and Cass. Mass Ave and Melnia Cass Boulevard is where the intersection of homelessness, our opioid crisis, and our mental health crisis are every single day. When I came into office, we, in this area of the city, had more than 200 people living on the streets, some for many years at that point, in nearly as many tents, fortified into encampments, daily fires that the fire department was going out to try to address because of the propane tanks to keep people warm, diseases and communicable illnesses spreading through, carried by rodents because of the unsanitary conditions that everybody was living in, violence, 
incidents of public safety that were spreading far beyond into throughout the city because of the need that was untreated there. And this had been going on for many years at this point. And in years past, there had been efforts to clear tents, and of course, they came back and people came back. And so we made a decision early on that the problem here wasn't tents. The real challenge, what we needed to support and, and empower is not removing tents, but building up people. And in just about now, a year ago, uh, we had launched a two-month effort to ensure that we were speaking with every single resident living in our encampments, understanding the needs, mental, physical, health-wise, on, on the recovery spectrum, and created an individualized plan for every single one of our residents living there at that moment, added 200 low-threshold housing units, and on a single day, January 12th of last year, coordinated the move so that everyone's property and belongings were carefully secured, transition and tr free transportation to their new low threshold housing with wraparound medical supports and services, and each of those 200 tents taken down because they were no longer necessary. <laughs> now, I said then to our residents, and I say again today, we did not solve homelessness on January 12th of 2022. We made a big effort, and we made a big step forward in terms of addressing the humanitarian crisis of people living on the streets in encampments. And two weeks after January 12th, we had one of the biggest blizzards ever in Boston's history in January, and I was just thanking um, everyone involved and, and particularly those who had divine intervention that the timing was such that we were able to save so many lives in that way as well. But I want to tell you about what's happened in the years since then because certainly we have much, much work left to do. When we began, there were almost 200 people on that first wait list for housing and we were able to create the housing that we, um, that was able to meet people's needs, 24-hour medical services available, connection to recovery treatment. Compared to individuals who have been seeking services on the ground without low threshold housing and supportive housing provided, that experience of living in a tent and still trying to get to a medical appointment, figure out what day it's on, figure out the transportation to get there, make it there on time, is near impossible. But for our residents living in these housing units, at any given time, we had about 90% working with a housing navigator, 85% with a housing plan in place, 60% with a housing resource in hand. They had a rent subsidy or a, a way to pay for housing and just waiting for that next opening in, in a permanent housing or an apartment to, to come by. Two thirds receiving regular primary care treatment, 50% receiving medication for substance use, Another, a third on top of that, receiving non-medicated treatment for substance use. A third receiving mental health services. Again, compared to the likelihood of being able to make it to appointments consistently living on the street, this has been transformational. Now, 50% of the, nearly 50% of the people in that original wave in our housing surge have moved all the way through transitional housing to a permanent home because they've been able to hold down a job and are able to pay rent because of the supports and services. And as people have moved on to that next step, their spots have opened up. Of course, more people have come. The need continues to grow, and more spots have been filled. We have served now more than 430 people through our, our phases of, of this housing, housing and support spectrum. Now, we can't do this without continued resources, and often that comes from state and federal partnership. And that comes from cities standing up together to say, we know what works. We know that this is about people and not tents. This is about services and not just syringes. And so I'm asking all of you to lean in with us. We have a lot more learning to do in Boston and I would love your best ideas, practices, data, research to really figure out how we can make this a sustainable effort. Our city is able to serve about 200 people at a time and then we add to our wait list and it grows. As the housing market federally, as the 
the economy goes in a difficult direction and the continued pressures that our families are feeling all come out at the city level, it is on our shoulders to think creatively and to really embrace what's possible. We in Boston have found that doing so means recognizing that when challenges are interconnected and intersectional, in fact, you can't tackle them one at a time effectively. You have to do it all at once and in a way that provides that wraparound recognition of the wholeness of people's lives. So I'm looking forward to learning a lot more from you all. Thank you so much for being part of this, and I'm really excited and uh, looking forward to your mentorship. Have a great day, everyone. Across this nation, innovative mayors have been leveraging coalitions that include government, philanthropy, education, business, and other sectors in effective effort to remove barriers to economic mobility. The kinds of barriers that have put the American dream out of reach for too many of their residents. The Walton Family Foundation has played an important role in many of these coalitions, and its executive director, Carol M. Stern, is here today to lead a discussion with two mayors well known to this audience. That includes their own experience with coalitions supporting economic mobility. I'm pleased to be introducing Carol whose leadership of the Walton Family Foundation and previous experience as president and CEO of UNICEF USA and in numerous other top leadership positions places her among the nation's most prominent figures in philanthropy today. The Conference of Mayors welcomes Carly Stern and we thank her for bringing this discussion to us today. Ms. Stern, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I am really excited to have this conversation with Mayor Randall Woodfin and Denver Mayor Michael Hancock, two gentlemen who I think will really exemplify the topic for all of us. So, we're going to talk a little bit about cross-sector collaboration in particular. The problems that our nation is are facing currently right now are definitely too complex for one sector to tackle alone. No one person, no one organization, no matter how large, is going to find that solution by themselves. And if we want solutions that last, that really stand the true test of time, we are going to have to grow our table, bring our voices together, and work together. We also need to recognize, though, that collaboration historically has been about finding folks with whom we have common ground and filling the table with them to work together. But what that has done to a large extent is grown our tables in two different places with great big divides. So at the Walton Family Foundation, we are trying to redefine collaboration. We want to let go of common ground and instead sit at the table with the people we don't agree with. Sit at the table with the people whose perspectives are different than our own. And instead of common ground, seek common solutions. We've seen that work. If you look at the past year, two years, three years with the pandemic, our greatest successes have been those cross-sector collaborations. When the business community came together and said, we'll stop making our product and we'll make the health needs that the communities need, and government cleared the way to make that happen, and philanthropy wrote the checks that enabled the factories to convert. And then government came back and found the distribution channels, and nonprofits supported that effort, and the business community continued to make those products. 
We know we can cross the sectors. We just don't do it often enough. And in my home region of Northwest Arkansas, we saw communities come together and build trails that not only help the environment, but they also help transportation, they helped access to health care, and they helped economic mobility. So what I'd like to do now is to bring our mayors out, Mayor Woodfin and Mayor Hancock, both of whom I think are experts on this topic amongst a room full of experts, and I'm excited that their insights will bring something new to this conversation. So Mayor Woodfin is serving his second term leading the city of Birmingham. His philosophy of putting people first guides his focus on enhancing education for young people, fostering a climate of economic opportunity for all residents, and leveraging public-private partnerships. Welcome. And Mayor Hancock, he's in his third term in the city of Denver, where he has lived since he was 10 months old. And I gotta tell you, I was really struck by that. He's chair of the US Conference of Mayors Communications and Transportation Committee, and he's vice president of the National Conference of Democratic Mayors. Mayor? <laughs> okay, so we're going to dive right into this. We've got about 11 minutes. Yeah, so it's very short time. What I'd like to do is start with a little bit of defining the problem, then we'll come back and we'll come back to the solution. So Mayor Woodfin, your city is really on the cusp of a new economic prosperity, and there's a lot of good news there. The region has the most healthcare professionals per capita in the entire country. You still have pathways from poverty to high-wage middle-class jobs as a top priority. So what challenges do Birmingham residents face when it comes to economic mobility? Well, first off, Carol, thanks for allowing me to participate in this conversation with you and these <clears throat> distinguished mayors across our nation. Um, I'll pick up on where you left off and actually comply with the question, which is defining the problem. Um, but part of defining the problem is to acknowledge um, the opportunity that exists, which is, you're right, uh, from a healthcare standpoint, that is, our, that is our economic identity as it relates to the healthcare industry. Um, we are fortunate enough to have, in our entire region, 3,500 employers that employs 80,000 healthcare workers. The University of Alabama at Birmingham alone, UAB, um, actually is the third largest um, public hospital in the nation with 23,000 of those actual healthcare employee, employees. Um, that being the case, uh, we have too low of a um, labor participation number for those who are seeking employment at a whopping 61% of only pe people participating in the labor market force. That's unacceptable. And I think within that, we first acknowledge that the city of Birmingham has a black population of 70%, uh, but our poverty rate is at, at right at 24%, which is extremely high. And in addition to that, over 50% of our households are led by single women. Mm -hmm. And so inequities that exist, they exist between the pay of women, uh, they exist uh, versus men, and then they also exist between black and white. And white. Mm -hmm. Mayor Hancock, Denver's a city known for a lot of natural assets. You know, we've worked together on a lot of things up in Colorado. Sunshine, mountains, a lot of outdoor recreation. But some of your natural assets are threatened, particularly water. Mm -hmm. So as the Western water crisis impacts the city and all of Colorado, what are the impacts and the challenges that Denver residents are facing firsthand? You know, our Broncos are also threatened, but I won't talk about that right <laughs> now. I knew it was coming. I knew it was Some coming. natural asset, you know. <laughs> You know, the reality is that outside of oxygen, water is something we all need to survive. And the reality is climate change has created a very serious and threatening crisis uh, for particularly the western United States. The Colorado River is drying up. I want you to, right now there are eight states that receive, and Mexico, that receive water from the Colorado River. And if the Colorado River doesn't flow, people in those eight states will not survive, including Colorado, and uh, other states like Arizona and Mexico and New, uh, New Mexico and, and, and California. Um, and so the reality is we know that when climate crises hit, low-income communities are the most vulnerable. 
And whether it's water or it's the old environmental injustice that occurred in the 50s and 60s where we built smokestacks near low-income communities or highways through minority and low-income communities, we have to work diligently with the new opportunities to reverse those trends. Now, we had an issue where we, you know, we had to consider whether or not to move a highway in Denver. By the time I came mayor, it had already been debated all the way back to Mayor Webb's time as mayor of the city of Denver. And so the study had already moved forward to keep it in place, uh, and it would have been ex too exorbitant, costly, legally to, to move because the counties, surrounding counties were gonna sue. But the reality is that we have an opportunity now to correct those, those uh, mistakes. And there's no time too late to say, we gotta do things to, to reverse climate uh, action, uh, climate change. We've gotta find a way to save our Colorado River so not only Colorado is out of the red zone or danger zone, but also the rest of the other eight states, seven states that are threatened by it. And we've got to be politically courageous enough to say we can change some of these environmental justices that occurred in our neighborhoods uh, and, and, and move those threats out of the way because ultimately it's our children and the children of these working families and communities of color that are most in danger. So where are you seeing progress on that? Like, what are you seeing, and how are people coming together to address it? Well, in Denver, we found just an example. Uh, we have a place called the National Western Center. You know, Denver has the biggest or largest uh, Western stock show, or stock show in the country um, right now. Right now, it's taking place this three weeks, and we have over, you know, six million people who will come in Denver during this time. Um, we're redoing that entire campus. We're making it more sustainable. Uh, we're bringing the surrounding communities in for jobs. We're redoing buildings that have strong or very high uh, NWBE uh, commitments to as we rebuild those communities. And we created a philanthropic uh, foundation that will take money for every activity that takes place on that campus that is now 365 days a year and will reinvest in the communities that surround uh, the, the um, the stock show, the Western Center. So basically it's, it's, it's making sure we're doing things in a sustained, sustainable way, but also taking resources and those activities and making sure the people who are most impacted benefit from those activities. Gonna come back to you in one minute. I got one more question for uh -oh. you. <laughs> Tell us what you're doing for Denver students in particular. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, I believe in the circle of, of, tr of care for our young people. And we now have initiatives in Denver that go from cradle to career. Um, every two, excuse me, every three and four year old has access to universal pre-K now in Denver, Colorado. People in Denver were the first to do that. Now the whole state has it. And we also passed a, uh, a tax that every young person in Denver who wants to go on to higher education or some vocational training program can also receive scholarship support from the people of Denver. And so our goal is, uh, and so the, co the goal is, what do we do in between? I think the most important role that municipal governments play is on the other side of that school door. Make sure they're able to get from their front door to the school door safely. And after school, when I became mayor, we have 27 rec centers, only 700 kids in Denver were members of our rec program. But yet truancy rates were high, dropout rates were high, and teen pregnancy rates were also high. The first thing we did was to remove that and say every young person in the city of Denver, the moment they register for school, is a member of our rec program. So now instead of 700 kids, 100,000 plus children are members of our rec program, and they're going in and out of our rec centers, and we got them. <laughs> Mayor Woodford, so you talked about the challenges to upward mobility, but you know your city has some unique assets. Tell us a little bit about how they're being used to move a path forward. And then also, tell me a little bit, follow up on that, about the, uh, the, the ways in which you won the $10 million through the Good Jobs Challenge. Absolutely. Well, yeah, tell us. <laughs> a lot of people want to know that. <laughs> so I think I speak for every single mayor in this room when I say we're tired of another study. I think when we all came into our office, there were enough studies sitting on the shelf somewhere collecting dust that Possibly you can blow some of that dust off and just go from there. So for us, there was already an, a, something called Build It Together that had been assessing and being on the solutions end of how do you be a bridge to those issues and concerns I described earlier. 
From that, we partnered with Brookings Institute, and then we created an organization called Prosper Birmingham. And it was a three-way simple notion. It was the creation of jobs, preparation for those same jobs, and access to those exact same jobs. On the creation front, what we needed to do is focus on that gap I told you of this 61% labor, um, labor participation rate. And so we applied for the Good Jobs Challenge. And when I say we, the city of Birmingham led, um, but that was a genuine public-private partnership effort um, with UAB, our economic development organizations and partners that existed in the community and city and region. And we won. That is a $10.8 million grant that allows us um, to scale up 1,000 people for those existing opportunities and jobs, which is a game changer for us. Um, and the preparation piece, um, because I just described the creation, on the preparation piece, um, an organization called Birmingham Promise exists that allows for young people to leave high school early, receive high school credit for working, work a minimum of 15 hours a week and be paid a livable wage of $15 an hour. Mm. As high school students, which for us, none of us in this room got paid $15 when we were in high right. school. Um, in addition to that, they can leave high school early, receive high school, they can leave high school and graduate and now enter a two-year, four-year public college university free. Um, if the college or university accepts them, we don't care about your GPA score. We don't care about, let me see, we don't care about your GPA. We don't care about your ACT or SAT score. If you are admitted, your tuition is paid. That's awesome. That is preparation for some of those same jobs. And then, ac then access to those jobs allows us to focus on minority and women owned who need to participate um, to support them and enhance opportunity as well. So I've got one minute left. So I'm gonna pose this to both of you. You guys jump in how you want to. What gives you hope? I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't he have this smooth Marvin Gaye thing up here? He, yeah. He's pretty smooth. <laughs> go ahead, man. Uh, it's the suit. <laughs> so, I just want to touch the three, hem of his garbage. Three things give me hope <laughs> because um, my, my, we're on the clock. Three things. One is the opportunity to still recruit, borrow, and find talent every day to come to City Hall. There's a lot of talent out there that has no interest in city government, but when we get those people at City Hall, their, their caliber and their ability to make a difference in community works, and it's impactful, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. The other is, is, is actually our youth that we're investing in. Uh, the next generation is poised to be better, and, better than us. It's our responsibility to guide and invest in them, so I'm very excited about that as well. I agree with that. I'll just take it from that last point. I think what gives me hope is really a lot of young people who are just breaking down walls and crashing barriers. In fact, you just saw uh, the first woman mayor, uh, Asian woman mayor from Boston, step on stage. We are seeing this every day happening, which means that as we begin to see more and more diverse leadership in America step forward, um, America has an opportunity, a greater opportunity than it's ever had. I think to be really realize this dream and to be the great nation that it's supposed to be. But it's going to take all of us and all of us have to continue to seize these moments and leadership opportunities. So on behalf of the Walton Family Foundation, thank you. What gives us hope is obviously a room like this. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to take some time this afternoon to pay tribute to a longtime friend and supporter of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, George Cloutier, co-founder and served as co-chairman of Partner America, a one-of-a-kind public-private partnership between the Conference of Mayors in American Management Services. Partner America is dedicated to small and mid-sized businesses to grow 
in the nation's metro economies. Formed in 1999, the program is the nation's first small business resource initiative, providing business management expertise, technical assistance, education, and government procurement opportunities to help grow small businesses across the country. Mr. Cloutier, steadfast commitment to the program over the past two decades has been instrumental in its success, which has greatly contributed to the vitality of the communities across the country. George always had a burning desire to work with and assist small businesses. The firm specializes in financial turnaround management and profit improvement for all small and mid-sized privately owned companies throughout the nation. Using just $42,000 in seed capital, George built his company into an organization of over 120 employees and tens of millions in annual revenue. Sadly, George left us on April 30th, 2022. But his passion and love for small business lives on through our partnership. Today, we would like to bestow this Lifetime Achievement Award posthumously to George A. Cloutier. And accepting on his behalf is Angie Sodi, Senior Vice President of American Management Services. Thank you, thank you all. This is absolutely wonderful. Um, I know that there aren't many mayors in this room now that knew George personally, um, unless Mayors Webb and uh, Mayor Benjamin are here in attendance, I don't know. Um, but for those of you who did not know him, what I can tell you is that he was extremely dedicated to small business and the small business community. He loved the Partner America program, and he greatly valued his relationship with the United States Conference of Mayors. You know, George did not believe that a business could achieve profitability through being financed or funded. George believed that he needed to roll up his sleeves with a business owner and do the hard work necessary to make organizational change so that that business could achieve real success, real lasting success. But now that George has passed, there still remains hard work that's left to be done. So in George's memory, I ask that you all continue to roll up your sleeves with us and encourage businesses within your communities to engage the Partner America program, to take advantage of it. It is a valuable resource for them. We want every small business owner to achieve the level of success that they set out to find when they started those businesses. So on behalf of Tiffany, George's wife, and his beautiful daughter, Holiday, thank you all. This means absolutely the world to them. And we appreciate everything that you're doing out there. Thank you. Okay, building on the momentum from last year's Mayor's Play Ball Activities, I would like to welcome to the stage Major League Baseball Chief Baseball Development Officer Tony Regan and former professional baseball player and current television sports commentator Harold Reynolds. Let's hear about play ball. Gentlemen.
Good afternoon. Um, just first, I wanted to say thank you, Mayor Couts, and a big thank you to President Suarez. Appreciate your, your support. Um, I'm not going to speak today. I'm going to let uh, one of my good friends carry the, the ball for me today. I want to introduce Major League All-Star, Emmy Award winner, and MLB Network host, my good friend, Harold Reynolds. Thank you, Tony. Hello, everybody. Tony's so humble, he won't even tell you that he's one of the higher executives at Major League Baseball, and he's one of the driving forces behind play ball. So you probably wonder what play ball is. Uh, play ball is really an activation to get kids involved in baseball. It's a community outreach. It's really basically what it is. So we're already in about 350 cities. I want to encourage the rest of you to do that. So you want to know what happens at a play ball event? Everybody stand up for one second. Just stand up real quick. You've been sitting for a while anyway. Shake somebody's hand at the table. All right, say hi, introduce yourself if you haven't. All right. All right, I love that. Now, one thing I've learned in TV, don't give up the mic, so it's time for you guys to sit back down. All right, I know I got a bunch of mayors, and you guys will take that mic and run with it. I know how that is. Hey, seriously, that exercise right there is what happens at a community outreach. Kids are meeting other kids. And if you are like me, I'm a parent, and your kids have gone through this pandemic. One of the things they've suffered more than anything, they live on their phone, they live on their, commu their, their computers, and they don't get a chance to talk and interact and all the things that we had to learn how to do. That's the biggest struggle with our youth today, is looking somebody in the eye and saying, hey, I'm Harold, who are you? And being able to talk and communicate. So what's play ball do? It's not just baseball. We're tearing down all those silos, those barriers, those things that kids need to have to be able to interact, react, and understand who they are and grow. So if you don't have play ball in your city, I encourage you to do it. It's real simple. We'll make sure we have people help provide to run the operations for you, show you how to execute it, all that. All we need is you, give your time and space, and Major League Baseball will bring the rest. And it'll be one of the greatest community outreaches you do. It's from all levels, all ages. I don't care if you're four years old or if you're 90. Speaking of 90 years olds, I had a 90 year old on a flight with me the other day. I was flying back, sitting next to this lady. How many of you guys have been mistaken identity? And you just say, never mind, I'm not even going to tell you who I really am. She was so happy. We flew from New York to San Diego, six hour flight, 90 years old. She's sitting there next to me, and her friends gave me one of these when she was walking on. We sat next to each other, and they went, moved on to the next two seats behind us, and they gave me one of these, like, you got her. I'm like, oh, great. So she talked to herself the whole flight. You know, my mom's 93, so she does a lot of this. So I was cool. I was, I was ready for it. So we land, and she goes, I really liked you on Remember the Titans, Denzel. So you know what I said after six hours? Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. So I'm going to say thank you very much. My time is up. But I encourage you, do these play ball events. Get active in your towns. It's a great way. And you being the mayor, you got all the power to make it happen. Thank you. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. And uh, Harold's going to be available right after this for about 30 minutes or so to take pictures. So if you would like to do that, Harold would be uh, at our, 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 our queue um, upstairs um, right after this for throw about 30 minutes. So thank you. I'm not Denzel, though. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Nearly two years ago, Fremont Mayor Lily May moderated a USCM webinar on preventing and responding to discrimination and violence directed at Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in our cities. And these problems have only increased since then. At the conference's leadership meeting last fall, we discussed the need to increase our focus on discrimination against and the safety of our AAPI communities. And Mayor May spoke to the importance of creating an Asian American Pacific Islander Mayor's Alliance with the conference. Working with our CEO and Executive Director Tom Cochran, we have done that. And I would like to call on Mayor May now to discuss why the Alliance is in, indeed important and what it can do. Please welcome Fremont, uh, Fremont Mayor Lily May. So good afternoon. Thank you to Mayor Kautz for her warm introduction. As we join our communities and many in our Asian diaspora this week in celebration of Lunar New Year, we welcome that this brings new opportunities and new goals. At our fall leadership meeting, I was honored to have the opportunity to introduce the establishment of the AAPI Alliance. It moved me greatly to receive the united support from the CEO and President Tom Cochran, President Suarez, along with our leadership board to begin this new USCM engagement effort to allow us to deliver a plan of action, not just to stop the pandemic, but more importantly, stop the virus of hate against Asian Americans. We must make a commitment to address the xenophobia, restore and embrace the diversity of our Asian heritages, and work together to provide a forum where we can encourage these conversations. To build a foundation to not just support the Asian American and Pacific Islander mayors, but also our fellow mayors interested in better serving their Asian American communities. Please join us in Columbus, where we will begin to develop this platform of mutual kindness and respect. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there, and I want to thank you all for this collaborative effort. This is what we have to do when we work together to build a better future. Thank you. I'm very pleased to now introduce a past president of this organization. Mark Moriel was mayor of New Orleans for eight years and led our organization during the crisis of 9-11 and subsequent uh, crisis and the subsequent time when we worked with the 20 uh, with the newly formed Department of Homeland Security since leaving office Mark has been president and CEO of the National Urban League working closely with us on priorities like sentencing reform job creation and so much more today Mark will be speaking about the state of the American city and the challenges ahead, focusing on the workforce, small business development, democracy, and extremism. Please welcome back home, Mark Morial. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I know it's been a long afternoon, and uh, many of you have other obligations, so I'm going to be as brief as possible. First of all, it is absolutely an honor to be back at the United States Conference of Mayors. Uh, I had a, the privilege and pleasure of being a member of this organization and serving as its president back in 2001 and 2002. But as important as that, this is a legacy for my family. My late father, Ernest N. Morial, served as mayor of New Orleans in the 70s and 80s and also 
led the U.S. Conference of Mayors in 1985 and 1986. I want to say to the mayors in the room, to the mayors who be, may be listening, the mayor is the best job in American politics. It's the best one. It's exhilarating and exciting. It's favorable and frustrating. It's trying and true. It's congratulatory and it's crying. It's an incredible opportunity to serve people. For American cities today, these are the best of times and the worst of times. And here's why. Never before in recent times has there been a president and an administration more committed to the American city. And I can say that because I've watched generations of presidents and administrations make promises, offer glowing, if you will, salutations, and in some cases, promise extravagantly and deliver meagerly. This president has populated his administration with no less than five mayors. Marsha Fudge at HUD, Pete Buttigieg at Transportation, Keisha Lance Bottoms and Mitch Landrieu at the White House, uh, Marty Walsh, who's at Labor, and Tom Vilsack, known as a governor, but he was once a mayor as well. And this president has put on the books and on the board a set of opportunities that every mayor should have a plan of action to take advantage of. I call it the big three, the infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act's climate provisions, the science bill, have the prospect of investing billions and billions and over a trillion in economic empowerment, jobs, and development. What your job is and what our job is as advocates of American cities is to make sure those opportunities don't bypass you. They don't bypass the cities. They don't di bypass the people who live in cities. They don't bypass the black and Latino and Asian and women workers. And that is our job collectively when there's opportunity on the board. These are the best of times and the worst of times because American democracy is being challenged. Every mayor in this country has to pay attention and understand that this prospect of voter suppression, vote dilution and gerrymandering is designed to undercut your power, your power in the state legislature, your power in the Congress, your ability to have legislators who owe you and the city their loyalty when it comes to public policy. These are the best of times and the worst of times. Mayors must remember that it was the city that was the birthplace of American democracy. Whether it was a small African village, whether it was the town councils in New England, uh, whether it was back in the Roman times, whether it was in Greece, it was the city that was the original unit of human organization. And that is where democracy truly, truly has its roots. So mayors, regardless of philosophy, ideology, perspective, friend or foe, you have to stand up with your voice for American democracy. It is unacceptable for people to use violence when they lose an election and they're mad. It is unacceptable to try to interrupt the orderly transition of power, speak up and speak out. America's mayors must be advocates for economic parity. We have a nation today with an economy that is almost 23 trillion in size. Notwithstanding that, the economy of this nation has grown in GDP 
by a five times factor since 1990. We still have in the cities too many people who can't make ends meet, can't pay their rent, can't pay their mortgage, can't afford the obligations they owe to their children. This has to change, mayors. Your power is not just your individual power with your city council or your business community or your labor leaders. Your power is the collective power in this city, working together, speaking truth to power on behalf of the people you represent. And the power of the Conference of Mayors is to bring mayors together from big cities, small towns, R, Ds, and Is, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, men and women, straight, and LGBTQ, bring them all together for common purpose. Stand up for economic parity. And finally, and finally, it's the city that has taught Americans how to live by side by side. It is the city that absorbed the immigrants that came here from Eastern and Western Europe in the early 1900s. The African-American migrants that left the South and came to the industrial North. It's the city that is embracing the new migrants from South and Central America, from the Caribbean and Africa and Asia. It's the city that has taught people how to live and work and struggle together. And if America would take a page and recognize that what we are today is one big city, one big city that has to disavow hate, that has to disavow this uh, lack of civility that has permeated the body politic in the public square, it's the city. And as leaders and representatives of cities, I encourage each of you to lift your voice forcefully and consistently on these issues. I appreciate your time today. I come as a recovering lawyer <laughs> and a recovering mayor who leads one of this nation's great civil rights organizations, the National Urban League. In many cases, we have a presence in your community. In many cases, we play a dual role. One is to partner with you to make the community better. The other is, yes, to hold you accountable. We play that role, and we'll continue to play that role. But our hand is open in a warm embrace as we step forward in this nation at these times. These are the best of times and the worst of times. Mayors, continue to lead. God bless you. It's always great to have Mark back in the house. Now, I am greatly honored to introduce our next speaker. We are lucky to have with us today the mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass. <laughs> mayor Bass is the 43rd mayor of Los Angeles and the first woman and second African American to be elected at the city's chief executive with an agenda focused on bringing urgency, accountability, and a new direction to Los Angeles, Mayor Bass is determined to bring a new day to the city of angels. Mayor Bass is a laser focus, is laser focused on serving her constituents, from issues of public safety and housing to economic opportunity. She has the guts to tackle the tough issues facing her city including homelessness. She has a long track record of delivering life-changing resources for her constituents, and she has spent years fighting for justice and opportunity for the people of Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming the new mayor of Los Angeles, Karen Bass. <laughs> Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that very warm introduction. I want to thank Mayor Suarez and Tom Cochran for putting this important event on. It is an incredible honor to be here with you today. I'm one of the newbies that are here. I've been a mayor for a total of five weeks. <laughs> and I will tell you that I am excited to be here because just in the couple of days I have been here, there is so much experience in this room and I look forward to learning from each and every one of you. Now I will say being here in Washington is a bit of a homecoming for me considering I finished in December uh, my sixth term, 12 years in Washington, D.C., and it was a big decision to decide to leave. But needless to say, when I was watching the way the 118th Congress was uh, sworn in, uh, I think I was kind of happy I was leaving the Capitol and going to uh, City Hall. But in all seriousness, the reason why I made this decision to, uh, to leave Congress and to come back to Los Angeles is because Los Angeles is in the middle of a crisis, like many, many cities are, uh, a crisis that I consider a humanitarian crisis, a crisis that I consider an absolute emergency. And in our city, the idea that we have 47,000 people who are unhoused, and that's just the city of Los Angeles, if I were adding the county, you have to add 20,000 more. So that's 67,000 people. And as many cities are struggling with tents and encampments all over the place, you can imagine how many tents and encampments that that is. So the voters in Los Angeles uh, tried a couple of times, taxed themselves twice. And in 2016, when the first tax was approved, there were 27,000 people on the streets. Now, after taxing ourselves twice to have the population of unhoused metastasized to that extent, you can imagine that voters in Los Angeles were angry, discouraged, frustrated. They taxed themselves twice, and what they saw was the number of unhoused people explode. Broken down RVs started to line neighborhood streets. Makeshift structures and tents popped up on sidewalks in parks, in front of schools, in front of businesses. And the problem, of course, when you have situations like that, is that Angelinos then began to feel unsafe. And we had an increase in crime with 25% of the homicides in Los Angeles two years ago were of people that were unhoused. Uh, and some unhoused people were attacked. So as the mood in the city began to be very negative, and as the empathy quotient decreased, to me, I was very, very worried that with an increase in anger, a decrease in empathy, that what you can have, that is a recipe for very bad policies. And for me, it made me have flashbacks to the 1990s in Los Angeles when we faced another crisis at that time. That crisis, from my point of view, was a public health crisis. You remember the crisis of the cities in the 90s? It was crack cocaine, it was gang violence. Los Angeles was the epicenter of the Crips and the Bloods. In that one year, in 1990, we had 1,000 homicides. And so what happened then was you had fear, you had anger, and you had terrible policies. At the same time as people were passing policies that, in my opinion, amounted to criminalizing a public health crisis, we also saw what I would describe as an evisceration of our social safety net. If you put all of those together along with some policies like welfare reform, when welfare reform really took effect during an economic downturn, you saw an increase of the unhoused population that then began to include women and children. We cut back on substance abuse. We never really built a mental health system, but cutting back and eviscerating substance abuse programs then led to the crisis in the 90s and what I believe we did was we passed very bad policies. We began to um, criminalize and incarcerate people, and it was the beginning of a time period that keep people called mass incarceration. So when I reminded myself of that time period, reflecting back on that, I felt like what we were experiencing in Los Angeles, we were getting ready to repeat history. And I think overall we tend to be an ahistorical society, and when we don't repeat history and we don't learn from it, I believe that many of the decisions that were made during those years 
contributed to the problems that we face today. So many people being incarcerated, now we're beginning to rethink criminal justice reform, or criminal justice policies. A lot of people are being released, but we didn't think about what was gonna happen to them when they became released. We had a 70% recidivism rate in California, but what has happened is California has downsized its prison population. They wind up being uh, released into communities and wind up being unhoused. Those were the reasons that led me to decide to run because of the crisis and because, as I said, I believe it is a humanitarian crisis, but this is an opportunity to learn from the past, to get people off the streets, but to also address why they were on the streets to begin with, and to acknowledge the diversity of the unhoused population, and not just the ethnic diversity, but the fact that the people who are on our streets there are there for a variety of different reasons. We have veterans that are there. In Los Angeles, we have people who live in tents who actually work full time. They just can't afford rent because it is so expensive to live in Los Angeles. Somebody might have had a credit problem. Somebody might have been evicted before and they're not able to rent again. Those are some of the reasons why people end up unhoused. In Los Angeles, we have thousands of children that are unhoused, women fleeing domestic violence. Uh, people who are suffering from mental illness and substance abuse. So my concern is, is that with the recipe of an angry electorate, with people feeling like they actually tried by taxing, taxing themselves and nothing happened, that that then is a recipe for people to say, you know what, let's just get rid of these people. Just move them away. I will say that in Los Angeles, the other thing that has happened is that a lot of the homelessness now is citywide and it's in areas that are very affluent too, that have absolutely no tolerance for this. People are to the point of saying, get them away. I don't care what happens to them. If you need to involve the police, that's fine. Just get them out of my neighborhood. The problem with that is that you can arrest somebody, you can give them a ticket, but they're going to be out in a few days right back on your street, and it doesn't solve the problem. So I ran for mayor after a very difficult, very expensive race. <laughs> Uh, when I took office on December 12th, I said the first thing I was going to do was to declare a state of emergency. We declared a state of emergency and people said, well, what does that mean? To me, it is a humanitarian crisis. I view it like a man-made disaster. And when you have an emergency, when you have a disaster, a natural disaster, you don't sit around and say, well, you know what? You need to prove to me that you've actually been homeless for six months. Uh, you need to have an ID in order for me to even provide any services for you. Well, if you've been living in a tent for five years, tell me how you're going to prove, one, that you've been there for six months, or two, that you have an ID. How about putting the person in a house, in an apartment, and then do the paperwork? So we declared a state of emergency. A couple of days later, I issued an executive directive that says we are going to fast forward building because it's very difficult to get anything built in Los Angeles, all of the red tape. But again, if you have the frame that it is a disaster, it is an emergency, then you're not gonna say, well, it's gonna take me eight months to do the inspection on your property. After we taxed ourselves, by the way, voters were appalled when they found out that to build one unit in an apartment building, it had cost close to seven hundred thousand dollars and the reason for that is because it took so darn long and so how can we expedite building so we did that uh, executive directive and I will tell you that the press conference that I had was at a property where they had been trying to break ground for 14 years and weren't able to do that so the other thing that we did is we launched a program called Inside Safe because my point of view is that what we have to do is we have to get people out of these tents. The fact that our society has reached a point where we accept people living on the street and living anywhere, it's like, what has happened to us? It is completely unacceptable. And so Inside Safe is a program that does not just move people away, certainly doesn't ticket them, but we send outreach workers, people who were formerly unhoused themselves. We, have, uh, we uh, rent out motel rooms, the lesson learned from the pandemic. I will tell you in the community, we were trying to uh, take over motel rooms 
30 years ago when the problem was much smaller and everybody thought we were crazy, but it took a pandemic for people to realize maybe we can utilize motels. Because of the lessons learned from the pandemic, we now have motel owners coming to us saying, please take over my property. It's a good deal for them. They get guaranteed income for several months. So we put people in motels and while we are fast forwarding the building, putting people in permanent supportive housing, but addressing their needs from day one. I believe that we have to have the whole of a government approach. We have to have the federal government involved, the state, the county, and the city. In Los Angeles, one of the problems that we had is that the city and the county were pointing fingers at each other. So we joined forces at the beginning of my administration, five weeks ago, <laughs> and the city issued uh, a state of emergency, as I described, and the county issued a state of emergency. So we are working lockstep with each other. We're also working with our state governor, our, our state government. Our governor um, is attempting to address the mental health issue through modernizing conservatorship. I happen to believe passionately that it is not okay to watch people die on our streets who are profoundly mentally ill. We know they are mentally ill, and for anybody to think that's freedom, I think that's extremely cruel. Some people need to be hospitalized, they can be stabilized, and then they can be referred back to the community or in support of housing. And so linking arms with the state government, and then of course, course, being here talking to the federal government. I'm very excited about the Biden administration's plan that's called All In, but here's my concern. If we do not address mental health and substance abuse, I don't care how much housing you build, we will not solve this problem. And I think, thank you. It is important that we learn the lessons from COVID and so work has changed. A lot of commercial buildings are underutilized. So we need to take those commercial buildings and turn them into mixed use or affordable housing. A lot of things we learned when we had a public health emergency. We learned what happens when you have a disaster that you're trying to figure your way out. I think we need to use the same point of reference, the same viewpoint to dealing with this problem. I've listened to other speakers talk about the problems in their city and their populations are much smaller. But let me just leave you with a warning from Los Angeles. Your population of unhoused might not be as massive as 67,000 people, but let me just tell you, if you don't get a handle on it, it will be. This is a solvable problem. We know how to do this, but we have to change our thinking away from the status quo, away from doing things as usual, and view this as a man-made disaster of the 21st century, and we need to all come together, lock arms in our cities, with our local government, county, state, and federal, and turn this situation around. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Bass, for being present with us today. Now, as a fun way to end this session, let me call to the stage 2022 World Series Mayors Jim Kenney of Philadelphia and Sylvester Turner of Houston to settle their bet. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, it's not a pleasure to pay this bet off, but I will anyway, we were happy enough to be playing baseball in November, and I can't think of a nicer guy to have to pay off the bet to. So congratulations to Thank the Houston you, Astros. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I certainly appreciate it. You got a fine team. One thing you don't have to worry about, you won't see my football team in the playoffs, <laughs> but uh, at least not this year. But uh, on behalf of the Houston Astros, we accept your beer. Thank you. you know. <laughs> this, is, this is Triple Bottom Brewery is a women-owned business who employs uh, formerly incarcerated and homeless people and uh, are terrific, terrific help for us in, in the city of Philadelphia. So I wanted to make sure we, we, we mentioned them. And one other thing, go birds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go Strokes. Yeah. Thank you to all our speakers. 
today and all of you who gathered to listen to these great conversations. And after this lunch, we have more informative sessions as listed in the printed agenda and on the app. And we have a great lineup for our Women Mayors Leadership Alliance Plenary, which is open to all meeting attendees. Again, thank you all. This meeting is adjourned.